Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, a new edition of Hashtag Expert Insight. It's been a while since Estate Living has done an online webinar. We've been very fortunate um, in the last year to take our events face to face. So in addition to what we're doing online, please look out for us at your nearest estate. We have a number of events happening there too. So today's Expert Insight focus looks at pretty retirement and I'm going to rephrase that because I was told before the start of this webinar we're not talking about retirement we're talking about refi retirement as in our new stage of life and uh, but what where, where we are at the moment is we're evaluating what is our current strategies and what it, for our future needs what are we doing now are we doing the right thing what are the kind of expectations around costs and uh and, and investment. And, and so I've brought together a group of experts that in each one of their industries um, are leading the way and will be able to provide us with some information. This is a very discussion-based webinar. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. So if you'll see for those that haven't been on a webinar for a while, the bottom of your screen, there's a couple of different options. You're gonna, if you click on the word chat, It'll open up a chat box on the right or left-hand side of your uh, screen. And this is where you can place your questions. My suggestion is that instead of selecting um, just a single panelist and host, rather choose the blue drop-down menu, the word everybody. That means that both the panelists and ourselves can see and the audience can also see the uh, questions you're asking. This video is recorded. So the recording will be made available towards the end of the week. So you can please share it with your family and friends or go through it uh, uh, if you choose to again. So let us, into, oh, sorry, last bit of housekeeping. Um, we will be also running a couple of polls during the course of the next 45 minutes. One has come up onto your screen at the moment. If you wouldn't mind answering the questions, they're just to get us a, a general idea of who we're speaking to and why you're here. Once you've done your poll or answered your poll and along with the, the, the folks in the back, you can just click on the box and it will take that, that poll question out of your line of sight. So let's, uh, let's welcome our panel um, to, the, to the floor, if we can say that. So today we are um, having got three great panelists. Um, Linda Smith, who's from a very exciting company called 50 Plus Skill. She's both the founder and social influencer, which I just love saying that, 50 plus and a social influencer. Um, and that's what it's all about. It's understanding what's happening um, in your time and space. And, and Linda's going to talk about her personal experiences and give us a little bit of insight into the lifestyle that you expect, which is very important when you do your budgeting. With us as well is Rob Jones, who's the founder of Shire Property. This is an interesting company. They work with um, various property developers. Um, they help set up and organize and run and not necessarily run, but uh, strategize around the best way in which to operate a scheme. And Rob will probably explain that a little bit better than I did. And then our third and the sponsors of today's webinar today is 10X Investment. Uh, Kilpatier is going to be speaking with us and he's going to talk a little bit towards what investment um, opportunities, products and, and strategies that you can take, that you can do. And of course, this is ahead of uh, 10X's huge no fees um, June that they host, which we'll tell you more about later as we go along. Anyway, thank you so much again to everybody that's joined us. And I think let's get going. It's a, We should include some questions, so please use the questions. I also received a whole bunch of questions when, when you uh, signed up, which we will also discuss during the course of this morning. So um, I think, Linda, if you don't mind setting off the morning or the afternoon discussion, um, I think you yourself, your personal experience regarding retirement, moving leaving your home, buying into a community, leaving a community, starting a business. I think this is a very interesting uh, approach to retirement or to refinement. And maybe you could just tell us a little bit about these experiences. Yeah, thank you, Louise. And hello to everybody on the call and those that will be listening later. 
So I, I find myself at my own crossroads at the age of 50, um, was divorced. My children had both just got married and both had left the country and was really at a crossroads. And at the time decided to, um, someone said to me, why don't you start looking at what retirement will look like for the 50 plus generation? So that was 15 years ago. I am now 66. And so I've been studying longevity and how that impacts anybody over the, in the second half of life. So anyone over the age of 50, we run an organization called 50 plus skills. We're possibly going to live 10 to 15 years longer than our parents and our grandparents. And so we need to think and plan completely differently to the way um, our parents did, because we're going to live much longer. We may not have saved enough. We may have been divorced like I was, so I don't have enough money. But longevity can be a gift if we unpack what that means for you. And for myself at 50, I really felt that I wasn't sure what was going to, what my life was going to look like going forward. But the minute I started to understand and study something new, I went back and studied a social entrepreneurship course at Gibbs. So studying later in life is one of the gifts that technology has given us and changing direction. But for each of us, we're unique. And so we really need these kind of webinars that help us to understand and to be educated, to be able to ask the right kind of questions. So if you, as you said that I moved, so I lived at Hodebeersport Dam, that's where I was for a number of years and made a decision I was going to sell my home and come and experiment. Because I think one of the things we need to do is experiment with what may work before we sometimes make a final decision. So I made the decision to put my investment away and to come and rent in the Western Cape. So to semigrate, which I think is a word that many people are using at the moment, and come and see whether I love the weather in the Cape. And at that stage, I, I was in my mid 60s and um, was able to do a, some contract work at the, the Somerset Retirement Estate, which is a beautiful estate in, 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 Cape, in the Cape. And so I came and lived in the estate for two and a half years to try and understand both the people living in the retirement village, as well as how that impacted me. And to be able to, as a, a life coach and a career coach for those over 50, to really understand the dynamics of retirement living. And one of the things that's really important when you're thinking about making these decisions is about wherever you go, you take yourself with you. So if you're not happy in one place, don't think you're gonna be happy in another. I loved my time there, but I felt that it wasn't exactly right for me in this season. And so I've moved again, um, now I have a beautiful view of the ocean out my window, looking at it as I speak to you, um, back into an intergenerational estate for another season. Um, and possibly in my 70s will then make a final purchase as to where I'm going to be. But things that are really important is our health, our work, our purpose, and our relationships. So these are all questions that we need to grapple with, and that's the kind of work that we do at 50 plus. So hopefully that's answered for you, Louise, yeah, sure. um, and set quite, the scene. Yeah, quite, quite a thing. Um, you know, you've touched on it. The having a purpose is so important and having the financial ability to experiment and I think that for some of us that might be a challenge as we move on uh, into later life um, at 50 you were able to I think 50 <laughs> I'm saying very biasedly I think 50 is still extremely young <laughs> and uh, clearly one of us is turning 50 quite soon um, so, so to be able to move, your kids had obviously left home, you had the flexibility to move, um, you had left a career, and when you made that move, you started a business. Had you ever imagined yourself starting a business? It's actually my fourth business I've started, okay. so I am an entrepreneur by heart, uh, it wasn't new for me, no. 
Um, I have naturally been an entrepreneur all my life. Um, however, I, I do a lot of work where I help people think through moving from a professional career into a portfolio life or an entrepreneurial type mixture of life later on. Um, you know, work brings purpose and identity, but often we want that to look very different in this next season of life. Mm. Um, and so certainly I have flexibility. I'm able to travel and visit my children. It's one of the reasons I'm still working and will continue to work is to be able to save enough money to visit them. Um, I have one bunch in Thailand and one bunch in London with grandchildren in both parts. So, you know, it's to be able to be flexible enough to work from anywhere um, and to build a new life. I think that for me was one of the things that was, was really evident at 50 was our children are a season of our lives. An empty nest is a massive um, transition for all parents. And, but we have to move on so our children can grow and become the adults they need to be in the world we live in. And so yeah. what happened was I eventually found this new purpose and thought to myself, pull yourself together. You have unencumbered time and you can make a difference for the next 25 years. And so that's what I get up to do every day. That's my purpose. Would it be important for people who are in their 50s now to put their feelers out for potential consulting jobs when they hit that 65 mark to be able to create that portfolio type working environment? So uh, a lot of the people that we work with, um, you need to grapple with what you're good at, what you're great at, um, what does the world need and where can you earn money? Those are the four questions that I often ask individuals um, and to help them start to create for themselves while they're still working. So I work a lot with individuals within five years of retirement to start to plan what that may look like because you don't end your work on the Friday and automatically easily um, start discovering that. Um, it's all about self-actualization and it's a journey that we should be looking at long before we get to that line of whatever your organization says you, you're retired because of the pension fund rules currently. Thank you. And I think that's another, and maybe we will move across to Rob just to um, thank you, Linda. Thank you for sharing with us that, that experience that you've had. Um, a big part of what you're saying to us is that you sold your main primary residence and you put it into an investment type wrapping and you're living off the proceeds of that currently along with the work that you're doing. So Rob, you know, being an expert within the retirement sector, and, uh, and I'm going to use the word retirement just because that sort of resonates with most of us. Um, the idea of selling your property, there's a couple of options. You can sell your property, you can keep your property, different types of, of options when it comes to retirement types of schemes. Perhaps that's been a question that's come up from uh, our audience prior to the event is, you know, what what um how would you describe the different schemes that you can invest in and what would that mean to your capital or how would you be able to access that capital right thanks uh louise thanks for having me on the panel and thank you to all those who've joined us today um so this decision about um, whether or not to move to an estate and then what form must the estate take is, is an extremely stressful decision for most people because it's kind of, you know, the, this is my last move type of uh, thinking. And that's why I always encourage people to do a lot of research about the places that they're going to move to. And people will often ask me, well, should I move to a life right scheme or a freehold scheme or a rental scheme or a sectional title scheme? And there's no simple answer to that. One has to go far beyond that simplistic uh, approach because there are good schemes of all kinds in our country. And um, you know, I happen to be uh, um, a lover of some of the life right schemes because it offers certain securities and, and benefits, but there are excellent schemes that have freehold components and, and, and uh, sectional title schemes as well. 
So the decision is really all about um, trying to maintain a sense of purpose as I move into my later life and reducing my anxiety about the environment and what I'm going to do and where my kids are and what I'm going to eat and how I'm going to get care and all of those things. These are all very valid questions. But at the same time, you know, having some sort of sense of purpose and community and so forth. So a lot of people in South Africa today are concerned about um, environmental risks, security, the economy, you know, power systems, all sorts of problems popping up. And so they consider this move to another country. Very few of them understand initially how traumatic that will be and the wrench away from community and family and, and just familiar environments where you can more easily um, maintain an income or some sort of society uh, without having to reform those connections in a foreign country. If you come from a foreign country, it may be slightly different. And if you're joining your kids, for a while, that may be different, but that's fraught with danger as well, because by the time you've landed and settled, your kids are moving to another country. So I don't recommend chasing your kids around the world. So the, a very good alternative to leaving the country is moving to an estate of some sort. And in the old days, you know, people would talk about old age homes and things like that. That's long gone. And even the name retirement village is fading to be something that is an estate that caters for people at all stages of life. So yes, you'll see estates popping out of the woodwork now that have got care services provided, have got catering, laundry, cleaning, gardens, dog walking, gutter cleaning, uh, you name it, the services will are becoming available in these in these exemplary estates. So to find the estate is really your task now. And in those last 10 years of work, you should be thinking about what you're going to do in your later life. Consulting is, is not the same as being in a corporate where you give instructions or you just sit and wait for instructions. Consulting work is a much more, uh, a very different type of role, right? You're, you're the lesser person, you're providing advice, you're not in charge usually. And so you have to start orienting yourself different. That can take 10 years of research to find the comfortable place to work. And then, and then, doing the hard work about researching the places that you want to move to, the neighbors that you're going to have, what are you and your spouse going to be doing in this new period? Um, and, and also just trying to fade the fantasy, um, this 50 year fantasy that's been grown in our heads about what this retirement thing is about is not going to be like that for most of us. Very few of us can afford to do nothing from the age of 60. Certainly, very few of us cannot afford to be just, you know, to have enough money to do nothing for the remainder of our lives, especially if we're living up to the 90s and 100s if we're uh, unfortunate enough to get beyond 100. So, yeah, I, I on my website, I have a free list of 59 questions that I encourage people to download and answer. And it's a tough list to, to do, but I really encourage people to work through it because these are very, very important questions if you want to reduce your, your stress in this environment. So uh, you, you asked a question about the capital. Do you want me to carry on? Um, yeah, yeah. I think just, just as a quick explanation, um, could you define just quickly, and because um, I don't want to assume everybody knows everything. Sure. So that, can we define what is a life right? And what is a sectional title of freehold? I think most people know a sectional title of freehold, but if you could explain the difference sure. between life rights and freehold. So, so in, in the sectional title freehold uh, world, you actually own something, you have a title deed, it's registered in the deeds office, and uh, you are responsible for that property, um, for the maintenance of the property uh, entirely if you're a freehold owner and, um, and so on. Life rights are different in that you are, you're not purchasing any property. You're purchasing or you're paying for the right to live in a property for the remainder of your life and your spouse's or partner's life. In some cases, it's two sisters uh, moving into a life right scheme. Um, and, and it doesn't really matter. In some schemes, you can do that. So two people move into a home, they can live there for the remainder of their lives, they pay a lump sum up front. And in most cases, when they terminate the contract, either by terminating it themselves or by both passing away, the, the amount that they paid for the property 
or for, for the right to live in the property is then refunded to the estate or to a person of their uh, wishes. So it's, it's like a lease for life where you've prepaid for the lease upfront, and then you're getting back the money that you pay upfront, but you're not getting any of the growth in the property. So um, that is really the fundamental difference between a life right and any other form of, uh, of uh, titled uh, property. And there are many benefits, uh, you know, pros and cons to both, I'm sure, but there are benefits to the life right approach. Um, thank you so much. So that then moves to our question. And before we ask Caleb, a lot of what we talk about when it, we talk about quality of life is having a capital investment that we can then extend or, or lean on. I'm not sure if the word is the right word uh, for the duration of the time for the remainder of our lives. So with a sectional title purchase or a freehold purchase, you can buy and sell as, as Linda's done, she sold, she's invested, and now she's moving around and eventually rebuys. With a life right purchase, you're buying a quality of life. Is that correct? How, in a way, could, I, could well, you, you say you're that? You're buying the right to live in a quality place, hopefully, in a quality building. And, and yes, so, but, but I mean, you can get a quality life in a sectional title scheme as well. Perhaps so for the price. Because this is always a debate. So the, between the between an investment conversation and a lifestyle conversation, if you purchase, right. so so from an investment perspective, and I think Helen will answer this question, but just if you could give us your thoughts from an investment perspective, if you are purchasing, or sorry, if you go into a scheme because you're not buying, you never own the property. If you're going into a scheme that is a life right scheme, um, what's what does that mean for your investment portfolio? So it's a once it's a once-off exit from your portfolio to purchase the property. It's a capital amount that you have to pay, which will not grow. On the other hand, you will not be paying a rental for a property either. And um, but what you are getting is a you're paying a fixed price upfront for the tenancy of that property for the rest of your life. That amount is owed to you. So in, in some estates, that can be repaid to you where you move, say, into a frail care center. If they have one on site, you can draw down on that amount um, without even exiting the estate. You can have it paid out as a lump sum to you, and you can then use it for your, for your uh, care in, in later life. So um, there's a lot of security in knowing that that is still there in the property, and you don't have the job of selling the property or maintaining the property or any of those other things that come with a sectional title or a freehold scheme. So one has to really look carefully at the financial implications of buying a freehold property when you may never have managed property or finances before, you now lost your spouse and you've got a property to deal with. That's not a problem in a life right scheme. I think for me, probably one of the most fundamental differences between let's say a body corporate environment and a life right environment is the management of the scheme. In a body corporate environment, it is managed by the members. So the members elect somebody and every year there's two new trustees that have come from some corporate environment who know the latest thing, they're gonna fix everything and they become the trustees of the estate. So you have quite a rambunctious AGM. You have new people who think they're gonna change everything and it can be quite unsettling for residents of the estate. Not always like that, but it can be like that. And there are ways of avoiding that and some schemes of avoiding it by having an executive managing agent and things like that. I want to complicate. In a life right scheme, the entire scheme is managed by the scheme owner, right? In the best life right schemes. And so you don't have to worry about this management. You've got a lot of consistency. And for retired people, consistency and uh, managed levies and no surprises are fantastic things to have. You do not need a stressful environment. In fact, that's the worst thing for you in your uh, later life. So you want to live in a peaceful environment where you know things are being done in a, in a way that you expect. You still want innovation, right? You still want to see the, the latest things. You still want freedom of choice. But we're not moving into your states anymore. We have to do a thousand things in your levy. You're getting more and more choice these days. But if it's properly managed, that is quite a big part of your problems gone. So 
those are fundamental differences between the two types of estates. Thanks, Rob. And I think you said a lot there, properly managed. That's always a difficult one for, I think, in homeowners looking at residential communities because there is a facade that you see when you drive into the community. And I think this, this goes for anyone at any stage of their life. You drive into the community and the sort of beautiful gardens with beautiful uh, facades. But that doesn't necessarily reflect on the management style and and techniques and uh, so it's always important to try like Rob mentioned do as much investigation as possible and you do have the right to request documentation that can prove that that particular scheme has uh, the ha is valid and uh, has is sustainable and and is reinvesting in itself as you mentioned and not just um, you know you're not still sitting with a with something that is broken and is never repaired but Let's talk about the capital. So uh, Kellen has joined us from 10X and they're all about the capital. And um, maybe Kellen, you could introduce yourself and, and what your role is. And then perhaps we could just look at, we're talking about schemes here at the moment. So if you have decided to sell your primary residence and move into a, uh, a scheme of sorts, life right or sectional title, um, Maybe you can paint us a bit of a picture of what that means from a financial perspective. Uh, so, so thanks very much for, for having me uh, on, on the panel. So it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm, I'm Kellen Potia, I sit in the investment team of 10X and I'm responsible for managing um, our suite of investment products. And I think as all the, the, the panelists have alluded to, making that transition to retirement is very stressful. A lot is changing. From a mindset perspective, you're going from a position of accumulating money. Every money, every month, you're putting more money away into your investments. You're seeing the, the value grow. Um, you're going out to work every day, and you're earning an income, and you've got security um, in your job. But once you get to the point of retirement, it's now about the capital that I have accumulated. How do I make sure that this is secure, and how do I make sure that this can support my lifestyle going into retirement? And so, you know, one of the first decisions uh, upon retirement you'll have to make is the money that I've been accumulating, whether it's from my investments, from my retirement funds, or whether it's from the sale of a property, uh, because I'm downsizing, uh, you know, the real question to ask is, what do I now do with this investment? What products are out there to help me earn an income in retirement? And so the first choice one will have to make is between um, what's called a life annuity, which is an insurance product, and a living annuity. Now, there's pros and cons to each, um, but you know more than 80% of investors in South Africa opt for a living annuity, and there's many reasons for it. I think number one is you are able to invest your capital in the way that you see fit, which means you're able to benefit from the growth of your capital uh, to maximize your income. It gives you flexibility to choose uh, when you would like to draw down your income, how much you'd like to um, receive each year. And that can change from year to year. And ultimately, um, it gives you the benefit of leaving a legacy, whether it be um, to support your, your spouse um, when you are no longer around, or whether it's um, to provide a legacy to build generational wealth um, for your kids. And that's quite an important distinction, um, that first choice. Um, and we, we always say to, to, to um, clients. So if you aren't sure, um, a life annuity uh, with an insurance company is a permanent decision. You're exchanging your capital in exchange for a guaranteed income for the rest of my life. But when I die, that money dies with me. That choice is irreversible. I've bought an insurance product. If you choose a living annuity, which is an investment product, if down the line you figure out, actually, I'm maybe not too comfortable with this, I would maybe rather prefer to have a lower amount of income, but guaranteed, you can always, you know, make that, that switch the other way around. So that's, you know, the, the first important decision you'd have to make in that, in that, in that shift. But ultimately, you're now at a position where you are drawing down from all the, the investments you've accumulated to date. So it's very stressful. It's very, um, you know, attempts um, to, to go through that, that transition, but ultimately it's really important to focus on the factors uh, that are within your control. And there's a couple of those. Sorry, so if you have a life 
annuity, it, and you mentioned the insurance product, are you saying that um, once you're in, you're in, you can't cancel that product, you can't, can't, you can't relook at it? And I think we had a question from one of the members of the audience asking, can you split the product? Can you put some of your money in a life annuity and some in a living annuity? And what would the benefit be of doing that? If yes, absolutely. Um, so it is possible to, to have a combination of products. Um, what we sometimes see is clients would take um, a small portion of their investments um, and they would say, this is the absolute minimum amount of money I need uh, to sustain myself um, from, from month to month. It's my, my rent, my essentials, uh, some living expenses, some medical care, etc. This is the minimum amount I need every month. Maybe this portion I'll uh, take out an insurance uh, life annuity for and have that amount guaranteed. But because I don't want to give up all of my capital, I want to be able to leave a legacy. I want to be able to have the flexibility to decide how my money is invested to benefit from the capital gains. Um, the balance is then allocated to um, a living annuity where they are able to choose the underlying investment portfolio. Um, but you know, ultimately, when you are going into uh, a, a living annuity, what you're ultimately doing is you are self-insuring. So you're saying, I want to sustain my uh, myself uh, through retirement. I believe I've accumulated enough income. Uh, and so the real question is, how do you make sure that your income lasts? Um, because that is a risk that you are, are taking on. And so, you know, we always in encourage people um, to control the factors that are within their control, which is um, the investment portfolio you're in. So you want a high exposure to growth assets and you want to have a well-balanced diversified portfolio to limit the amount of risk you can control your drawdown rate which is the amount of income uh, you are uh, selling down from your investments each year um, if you're drawing down too much income you can run out of uh, investments uh, in, in a matter of just a few short years um, if you don't plan properly and so it's important to choose an amount of income that's sustainable that both your investment uh, returns and fees can support. And that brings us to, I think, the third thing that's in control uh, that too few people appreciate the power of, which is controlling the fees um, that you're paying in the management of your investment. You know, saving just 1% uh, in fees um, could allow you to have 25% more income or to, if you don't need more income, to make sure your income can last longer. And so with all the uncertainties around you, there are very key components that you can control, uh, which can help, you know, stabilize you as you go through the transition from working life to uh, retirement or, or re rewiring. Um, and coming from the question coming in, is there a sort of rule of thumb when it comes to drawdown fees, a percentage? Yeah, so when, when it comes to how much income you should draw down, um, you know, it is very, very personal, depends on your circumstance and very much depends on the investment portfolio that you selected. Ultimately, um, the returns you're generating need to match up uh, to the income that, that you're drawing down. And so that's why having the right portfolio to match the drawdown is required. You know, the, there's many studies out there that um, make the case for um, 4% being a sustainable uh, drawdown level. But again, it's very much dependent on uh, the investment portfolio you're in and then fees is, is really important right because if you have you know one percent um in in fee savings that's 25 percent more income but if you were supposedly drawing down a sustainable amount of income of say four percent but you're actually paying fees on top of that of three percent it means you're actually drawing down seven percent of your investment value per year and so while someone might be um, un unknowingly choosing a sustainable investment drawdown, uh, but paying almost as much in fees, they could still be on an unsustainable path. And so those three factors all go hand in hand when securing your retirement income. Um, I'm just to pop a question to Robert and um, in line with that drawdown. Um, so when you're investing into a scheme of any sort, how, how much control have you got on the levy increase? And, and how would you factor in how much I need 
if, if I decide I do a split model, I use an insurance product to cover my essentials like my levies, my rates and taxes, and I use the rest of my investment portfolio to cover the lifestyle aspects. How would you predict that from a costing perspective? Okay, so um, it's like trying to predict the future. Um, it's an Im almost impossible task. So all you can do is mitigate the risks by choosing a scheme that has um, a reasonable approach to levy management and increases. So the best schemes have got a levy uh, stabilization fund, which is contributed to by residents who sell from the estate. So in some uh, estates, a percentage of the sale value or a percentage of the gains that they've made are contributed back to the association that runs the place. Um, and this would be like a, a body corporate or a homeowner's scheme. And then that is used to stabilize the levies during hyperinflation times or periods where you have a spike in uh, the cost of food because of um, a famine or a drought or, a, or electricity, uh, to use a topical thing. But so those schemes have got a, a very thoughtful and analytical approach to levies. They know exactly what, how much of our levy is made up of food and how much is electricity or how much is garden services or labor. And then they will increase those components in a rational way using statistics essay. You know, so you can almost predict what your levy increase is going to be if you look at, at, the, at the little formula they give you. And we, we do that in all of the, the best estates. There's a, there's a rational approach, right? It's not just some trustee sitting and saying, oh, let's make it 10% this year. No. Um, so I think that's number one. Make sure there's a levy stabilization fund. Make sure that there's a rational approach to levy increases. And that's pretty much all that you can do. Then you can elect reasonable trustees, or you can purchase into a good life right scheme where the, where the management of the scheme are, have an interest in keeping levies stable. And so they temper the levy increases below inflation uh, or at inflation. And or they may even subsidize the levies themselves to keep the residents uh, stable, their lives stable, which is really the, the prime should be the prime mover of every owner of a retirement village is to keep stability and calmness in the estate. And that is, levies are the biggest concern for most residents. Totally. I hope that answers so, the question. Yes, absolutely. Um, so taking that into consideration, Helen, when you are, when, when you have a new client that's coming in and is looking at structuring a solution for their funds. What is, I know that you don't supply advice, but what set of products, if I could say, would be able to work, you know, be able to maintain that standard of living? You know, I know that, uh, you know, what Linda spoke about is the emotional, this emotional need and financial need to supplement our income and keep us keep us active but from an investment perspective you speak about diversification there's so many new products on the market people looking at bitcoins and whatever else and i think that we're also a vulnerable market because we you know we don't know necessarily know about all these different types of investment schemes out there so how would you how would you report a solution to to your investors yeah, so ultimately, you know, it, it's it's going to depend, you know, on, on each individual circumstances. But, you know, we 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 always try and remind clients that, you know, typically when, when someone is going into retirement, um, the perception is that I now need to not take any risks. I now need to just, um, you know, you know, batten down the hatches and and just take what I have and put in an absolutely uh, low risk investment, and and that's the, the conventional wisdom. However, as a retiree, you are still going to live for another 20, 25, 30 years from, from the time of your retirement. So you're actually a long-term investor. And to make sure that your income can keep pace with inflation, it's important to invest in a portfolio that does have a high exposure to growth assets, which are stocks and, and properties. Um, those, those portfolios deliver returns above inflation. And so, you're able to maintain your standard of living due to the performance of the investment portfolio that you're invested in. But that's in stark contrast to um, an insurance product, for example, where 
you are going to have a guaranteed level of income, um, but you're either going to have no increase or you're going to have a fixed uh, level of increase in your income uh, each year, uh, which is invariably below inflation and you have no control over that. And so that's why it's important to make sure that you, you're retaining that flexibility in your retirement setup to be able to adjust your investment portfolio, to have the right growth assets um, and invest in a portfolio that's going to generate real returns above inflation over the long term over your investment time horizon. Um, can on that note, talking, what about if you um, are emigrating? I know we speak about it a lot of, we've seen it that a lot of uh, children, our children have left. I mean, I, I speak as a parent of a child leaving school soon, how they would like to study overseas if it's affordable. Um, what do you say to, to that type of person who's looking at, should they withdraw their retirement fund out of South Africa? Should they... You know, I know you can't give advice, but um, how would you manage a situation? How would you best uh, manage a situation like that? And what is the look, tax implication, if you know? Yeah, that? look, the most important thing with uh, investing for an income in retirement is you need to match your investment assets to your liabilities, which are your expenses that you need to come up with each month. If you are living in South Africa, um, you're going on holidays around South Africa, you're paying for your groceries in South Africa. The majority of the expenses are in rands, which means that your investment portfolio needs to also have the majority of its assets invested in, in rand denominated assets to match uh, liabilities. Otherwise, we know how the, the rand dollar exchange rate is, the currency blows out. If you were invested all sort of offshore, um, you one month would suddenly find yourself with not enough income to, to pay for your, your groceries that month. However, for someone who is actually spending the majority of their time outside of the country, whether they've moved permanently or whether they are spending you know, several months outside the year to visit um, children, a lot of your expenses are then actually in hard currency. So in that instance, one might opt for uh, an international investment portfolio which has a greater proportion of offshore um, investment, stocks and bonds, which are deriving their value in hard currencies like dollars, pounds, euros, in which case you don't need to actually remove your, your investments from your living in Newton South Africa to support your immigration. In fact, you retain the same investment uh, structure. All you're doing is you're changing your underlying investment portfolio to one that is an international portfolio with greater offshore exposure. If, however, someone decides that you know, they actually need to get their capital out, um, they, they need to, I don't know, perhaps uh, buy a, a, an apartment or something um, overseas, then unfortunately you would have to work within the restrictions of the product. So the, so the maximum amount you could draw from your investments each year is 17.5%. So you would ultimately draw down 17.5% each year until you uh, recoup your capital and then once you've hit your your minimum of 125,000, you can then commute the the full investment value. Ultimately, it, it comes down to matching your assets and liabilities and knowing what what you are planning towards. Thank you so much. So sure. So lots to lots to think about. I think let's uh, we're coming to the end of our our, our show. Um, and just to maybe Linda, if you could round it off. Uh, you, you know, there's often a dream um, that that we, like men, Rob mentioned, what what retirement should look like, and that is to you know move to the coast, buy a house on the beach, and live happily ever after. Which I have a sneaky feeling you kind of have done, as you mentioned, you've got a sea view. Um, what, now that you're in that position, maybe you could say how how close is the is the dream to the reality. And and how and if that is your dream, to retire to the coast or to re retire overseas or whatever it might be, what what would you advise someone at fifty five years old to put in place now to let that dream to to make that happen? So Louise, I'm going to turn your question on on its head because <laughs> I would be happy anywhere because I'm happy within myself. <laughs> um, but I, ha I have done a lot of the work 
um, in trying to understand what my um, possibilities are in my life um, and what would be best for me. So planning, 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 education, and finding what works best for you around where your family is, finding purpose in your life. Um, it's not always just about the home. It's about the house. It's about the home and the life that you build. So um, for me, that's the most important thing. Wise words. And having, and having the money, having the money to be able to not be anxious every day. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's quite exciting to hear that there are opportunities out there. So that brings us to an end. Thank you so much to everybody who participated today, who came and joined us. Uh, we hope that we will have more of these kind of discussion forums. Um, this, as I mentioned, this content will be available um, on our State Living's YouTube site. Um, everybody is contactable. So if you would like to speak to Kalem or to Rob or to Linda um, outside of this conversation, please feel free to contact me at louise at estateliving.sa.ca. I have come up in the chat for you. Um, I think Naomi posted it earlier. And, um, and we're here to answer your questions and uh, not to forget that uh, June is a, a fees-free month. And as, uh, as Kellum alluded to, a reduction in fees can, uh, fees can make a big change. So it might be worth doing a, a cost comparison um, to see whether the, how that would benefit you. Um, any questions for Rob or Linda, please feel free to share them with us. And thank you so much for your time. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day further.